2020, the world faced its greatest crisis since the Second World War. Lockdown, social distancing, self-isolation, track and trace. The language of coronavirus is something we've all become accustomed to as we adjust to life in a new normal. Throughout the pandemic, the University of Kent has sprung into action, providing support to those who most need it. Here are the stories of a community coming together through research, innovation and enterprise. Here is Coronavirus Kent in Action. Most people who catch COVID-19 will experience only mild symptoms and recover quickly, but older people and those with underlying health conditions are more likely to become severely ill, with men at higher risk than women. Professor Martin Michaelis and Dr Mark Woss are part of a team at the University of Kent working to gain a better understanding of this disease. We're interested in using the large-scale data that becomes available from the SARS coronavirus to outbreak and using that with the other, other large-scale data that's available uh, about human genes and proteins so that we can try to understand why the virus causes disease, why it differs from other related viruses and why we see different responses in individuals. We look for factors that are differentially expressed between females and males because males are more likely to have severe disease that increase with age or decrease with age because age plays an important role. It's a bit like a, a puzzle actually where you put thing, the pieces together to learn more and the more people that do, do that, the more we will all learn together. Together with colleagues in Frankfurt, Germany, the University of Kent team have identified two possible treatments. The first is called a protonin and is already licensed in Russia to treat influenza. It's been shown to prevent the virus from entering cells, acting as a viral blockade. The second is a meprazole, normally a drug used to treat heartburn. Early signs show together with a protonin the antiviral effects of the drug are increased. These drugs are currently undergoing further testing. If they prove to be successful and were made to be readily available, it could change the game in the battle against COVID. That would make a huge difference because you would have fewer people on, in intensive care, you would have fewer people on ventilators and hopefully you would have fewer deaths. And, that, and if obviously the ideal solution for the problem is a vaccine, but we don't know whether we will ever have that. But if you have drugs, you can manage the disease much more efficiently. So what's next? We're often thinking of this uh, Agent X or, or Virus X, this new pathogen that's identified that we haven't encountered previously. And so the more we know about the viruses that we currently encounter, the better prepared we are to treat those viruses and also these viruses that we're not, not aware of. If we understand better why viruses cross species barriers and when, and and what are the requirements, we will be able to monitor that much better and will hopefully be better in predicting the risk of such spillover events much earlier. As well as making medical discoveries, the University of Kent has produced invaluable supplies of PPE at a time when it's been needed most. We started to realise early on into lockdown that there was a need for PPE in the local community. And so we looked to see what we could do as a university. The whole university collaborated, all, um, several schools, a school of uh, physical sciences, uh, engineering and digital arts, architecture and school of computing. We all contributed whatever resources we had and set up um, what, yeah, what was effectively a, 
a factory really. We've produced just over 4,000 face shields so far and they've been sent to places such as Pilgrim's Hospice, the local hospitals. We've also helped care homes as well. There was a real need for care homes who were, who were one of the areas that were really suffering um, with PPE. It was the first time that we've kind of brought all the technicians from the university almost under one project. And so I think it really kind of showcases what we're capable of. Um, certainly the, the ability that we kind of get a CE marking on our things actually shows what we've produced, you know, it is up to what you would consider a high industrial standard um, and that we can do this locally. And so I think it really kind of demonstrated both the scale we can operate at, but also the kind of the actual technical knowledge that we all have to be able to actually deliver something like that. Part of us having technicians on site and the skills available at a time of lockdown, um, we really wanted to utilise those skills and be able to do something positive at a time when there was so much negative. Um, and so I think for the, the individuals involved, it was a way for them to really give back, to make a difference. And I, and I think we're really pleased with not only the face visors that we made, but then the subsequent work that went on to support other areas, um, which, um, which has, has made a difference. Messaging on the coronavirus needs to be clear and targeted. That's according to a group of scientists advising the government on social distancing. While well, Dr Jeremy Rossman from the School of Biosciences has been both clear and targeted in his analysis throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So Jeremy, thank you for joining me. And you've appeared a lot in the media talking about this. How important is it for experts to spread the correct information? This is an absolutely critical component of the COVID-19 response because we're asking the public to do a tremendous amount and make a lot of sacrifices. So making sure that we are clearly communicating the rationale for this, what the current situation is, and why these actions are so important is absolutely critical. Now, this would be critical in any emergency situation, but right now we're also facing what's been called the infodemic. This is the tremendous amount of information, both correct as well as misinformation and disinformation that is going around on social media, on the web, on a lot of different platforms. And so it's even more important to be providing very clear, very specific and very factual information that people can use in their daily lives. And what have you made of the global response to the pandemic? So there really is no global response. And this is something that is, you know, a real problem and will become a bigger problem the longer this goes on is that there is not a global response. What there is, is a collection of individual responses from individual countries. And these run an entire gamut from countries basically doing absolutely nothing, saying that COVID-19 is not a problem or that they've already cured COVID, to countries that have taken very strong preemptive action. And it's had implications on public health and the economy. What other wider implications can it have and how long are we going to be seeing this around? Already, COVID has had a tremendous impact across many aspects of life. And this will continue for quite a while. But of course, how long COVID goes and how this pandemic progresses over the coming months to years will, of course, shape what we see in the long term future. I'm Dr. Suki Bamra. I'm a lecturer in pharmacy clinical and professional practice at the Medway School of Pharmacy. My research is set out to explore the impact of COVID-19 on community pharmacies and community pharmacy teams. When GPs closed their doors um, and went on to digital consultations, pharmacists were still open and had to communicate via face-to-face -face interactions. Initially, pharmacists were not listed as 
key workers in the government list of key workers and there was significant backlash from pharmacy representative bodies and professional bodies and in response to this a survey was launched to look at what impact COVID-19 has had on community pharmacy teams, not just professionally, but also personally on their physical and mental well-being as well. The survey is designed to look at sort of the implications on workload, so what's changed, if anything has changed, and it's giving pharmacy teams the opportunity to discuss what's been going on during the pandemic, so what they've experienced. So far we've had over 650 responses. Surprisingly, they've the amount of information that they've they've disclosed has been significant. They've, they've really opened up and, and gone into a lot of detail about how they felt. We had an increase in demand and a loss of staff. We had a lot of customers that were also very, quite rightly frustrated with the fact that they needed the medication. And because the GPs were closed and the GPs went in lockdown, the only point of contact that they had was us. So we kind of bear a lot of the brunt of the displeasure from the customers. So we had a few incidents of patients not being happy with what was happening. Any patient with a long-term health condition, we will see them at least once a month. So we deal with the patients a lot more, but when they talk about, to make policies and all of these decisions, pharmacy is usually an afterthought. Just having someone ask us about how we're doing, how we're actually dealing with the situation and what is going on is extremely useful and also having a collated evidence that can then be presented to government or to whoever is in charge of how things are actually happening on the ground and hopefully that will lead to changes being made that will make our working and also the standards for our patients a lot better. What we need to do as, as a pharmacy team, we need to support each other better. So I think we've been put in a position where we've identified what's going what's going wrong and where, where people need support and we should be able to sort of better manage and support people going forward. The financial cost of the coronavirus has been felt by thousands of people and businesses and Khawa Navid Bati from Kent Business School has helped coordinate a support service for small and start-up businesses who are most in need. So Navid, thank you very much for joining me. Can you tell me a little bit more about Ear for Business? We just thought it would be amazing for us to set up a service where we, where we could um, support our local community and our local businesses uh, and deliver some, some sort of help uh, even if it's just picking up the phone and listening to somebody, somebody went about, uh, you know, their day or how, how a decision in their business has impacted them. And then tell me a little bit more about the services that you actually provide for them. As a listening ear service, we're not providing advice. We're just listening to somebody explain to us their specific business issue or specific problem that they're facing. Or if they're a startup, if they're thinking of taking a decision um, in, a, in a certain direction, we can listen to it and we can just point them out and uh, point them in the direction like here read up on this what do you think uh, is happening um, you, uh, you know there might be support available for your specific issue from the government uh, the, the one I like to say that you know confounds most people is that when, when I started my own business on the side it just cost 12 pounds and people are always amazed by that because you know the, you go to the consultants and, and such and um, you, they're, they're charging hundreds of pounds for this um, so it's, it's a way of us communicating, especially for me, because I've been on that similar journey, how people can save costs, how people can, uh, you know, trim down um, and make the, make the difficult decisions that they need to make uh, in their business, even if it's not just straight out telling them that this is what they should do, but just uh, listen and guide into a, into a certain direction. And how important is it to listen to these businesses at this time? It's as important to listen to businesses uh, and not just dictate your own theory of what's going on because uh, at any point in any situation, somebody's facing a, an issue that is unique to them, unique to their industry, unique to their specific business. Uh, and it's only through listening uh, and understanding their problem, um, you know, when, when you can start to work out a way to, to help and support others. My name's Carol Barron and I'm Director of Knowledge Exchange and Innovation here at the University of Kent. 
In response to COVID-19, the business and industry team hosted a series of free webinars to help support the recovery of businesses in Kent and Medway. In collaboration with our academics and also our partners out in the community, they developed a range of topics that would help address some of the issues that businesses are facing right now. Some of the topics included online security, e-commerce and also reimagining tourism. We had delegates join us from far afield in the United States, the Netherlands, even Manchester United Football Club. We've had an overwhelming positive response to the webinars. We had the support of our business leaders helping to shape the series, as well as recommending them to their clients. But it's vital now that we all come together to support the business community. I hope the webinars will go a long way to helping address some of the challenges they're facing. We'd welcome the opportunity of talking to you about how the University of Kent can help your business, or if you just want to find out how to access the webinars. How do you do that? It's easy, you just have to email us on businessrelationships at kent.ac.uk. My name is Jenny Batchelor. I'm, I'm Professor of 18th Century Studies at the University of Kent. COVID crafting is a very, very uh, popular, uh, frequently trending hashtag on Twitter and Instagram these days. And that's because, of course, so many of us, myself included, are trying to accommodate ourselves to this new reality of COVID and the stresses and strains it brings, the boredom, the loneliness of lockdown, the tedium of lockdown, the repetitiveness of lockdown. I've been working for, well, seven years or so on a, a fascinating publication called The Ladies Magazine, a hugely popular a monthly magazine for women, I would certainly argue the first recognisably modern women's magazine that starts publication in 1770 and runs through to 1832. We can't be entirely sure um, exactly how many people read the magazine or subscribe to it, but our best guess is about, at the height of its popularity, around 10 to 15,000 copies a month. A novel like Sense and Sensibility was published in a pretty standard print run of 750 copies. So this is like hugely, hugely, this is mass media really. My name is Alison Larkin. I'm an embroiderer. When Jenny posted pictures of the patterns that she had found in the ladies magazine I pounced on them because this was real Georgian embroidery patterns they were authentic patterns could I you know what could I do with them and we were talking about ideas about getting the patterns out there and how we might spread the word and the idea of the book came out Jane Austen embroidery and it, it yes it came out about two weeks before lockdown in the end and embroidery has been an absolute godsend I know of a lot of friends in the in embroidery circles who have been using embroidery as a way of coping with lockdown. We've had some really wonderful responses to the projects in the books. We're finding that people are, are approaching the patterns now with creativity and flexibility. So one of my favourite examples recently is someone who um, in, in the US um, who has been taking some of the motifs from some of the patterns and, and putting them on COVID masks personalising their COVID mask with a ladies magazine pattern from 200 years ago. I mean, I just, I absolutely love it. My name is Susan Bennett and I'm a headshot photographer based in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, like a lot of Americans, I have not been able to work since March. My business has been entirely closed and I found myself at home really worrying a lot and leading a very quiet and confined life, as Jane would say. I ordered the book right away. I had not done any embroidery in probably eight to 10 years. I think the thing that's so exciting is feeling more connected to Jane Austen, like these are patterns she may have worked on. And I really want to thank Jenny and Allison for doing the work to put this together in a format that we can use. I'd felt for a while that I wanted to create 3D embroidered flowers in pots. And one of the ladies' magazine templates was perfect for an 18th century inspired pot for my embroidered paper poppies. I now make auricular pot plants, which are proving really popular, even more so during the pandemic. One of the wonderful things about, about 
needlework, about other forms of craft and about making is it feels like you're putting something together when the sounds are shifting under your feet and things are breaking down. We're sort of making a new community around the magazine, this wonderful coming together of people who are making and recreating these patterns 200 to 250 years after their first publication right now and I think that's just that's just wonderful and very much in the spirit of the magazine itself. And finally, this is the show-stopping video that made a Kent family go global. The Marsh family's rendition of the Le Miserable track One Day More has been viewed more than 10 million times, something none of them could ever have imagined. None of us kind of knew how to process it. It just felt like such an unknown thought that we, people We started were by trying, trying to make sense of it in terms of numbers and scale and saying, well, okay, 20,000. Nothing we've ever done has ever, nothing no. we ever do will ever be seen by that many people before. Like my, a typical academic history book reaches about 300, 400 people yeah. or something. And then we were saying to the kids, well, that's probably, that's a football stadium full of people. And they go, wow. And then it was like, that's three football stadiums, that's 10 football well, stadiums. And also we tried to like all of the people who were, you know, heartfelt messages. It, most of it, it kind of exploded overnight. So we were all in bed and we woke up the next morning and as the day went, went on, it was like the numbers just kept going up. So it, and we were just saying, we were like, just... I wonder if it's going to make it to this fuse, and then just kept going up, really. It was exciting, it was scary, it was totally surreal, and I still had to go and get the washing out and, and make everybody tea. So it was, yeah, people say, what is it like to be famous in your living room? Well, very strange, because it's totally ordinary and totally abnormal all at the same time. News outlets in every corner of the world ran with the story of the musical marshes, and soon the A-listers joined in, with Match of the Day's Gary Lineker and Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill, taking to social media to show their appreciation. Eddie Redmayne, who played Marius in the film adaptation, gave this special shout-out. Do you see the Marsh, uh, the Marsh family's Le Miserable One Day More parody, which has been keeping us all brilliantly entertained? Uh, that young guy had a much better singing voice than me. My my favourite has to be this morning and meeting Holly and Phil. It it was yeah surreal. I liked reading out the comments and the people saying nice things about our video. Looking back now, the family hope they were able to offer a laugh and a smile in such difficult times. We might be a little footnote in that story, and that's that's nice, that when all this dreadful stuff was happening and when everybody was really grasping to find a way forward, we were part of that positive story, and that's, that's nice to know. It makes us feel like we're making a difference, which is yeah. really the most important thing, because that all we wanted to do with the songs was have fun, lift spirits, which is, which is essentially what we did, so we couldn't really have asked for more in terms of that. And will we hear them sing again? We ummed and ahed as to whether to instantly retire because you can't, there isn't like this the difficult viral second album, right? But we, we didn't want to stop doing music over, over the summer. And the important thing is to carry on making people smile um, and I think to work, to work collaboratively. And, and that's part of the messages that came back from people involved in Les Mis productions as well. Um, very much with the same sort of ethos so that, that music can, can bring people together in a way that I think nothing else can. Tomorrow we'll discover what Tesco one line has got in store, one more door.